This show is usually on parenting and education, but given everything that is going on in the world, I thought it was worthwhile to take, you know, say 20 minutes or so to talk about what is affecting all of us right now. Of course, the coronavirus or COVID-19. So today, I'm happy to say I'm having on Amish Adalja, a doctor and expert in infectious diseases and pandemics. And I mean that literally. This, this is his job. Amish is the real deal, as you're going to hear in a minute or so. Now, the other thing to note up front is that I wanted this discussion to be as grounded as possible. So, you know, as simple and non-phony as it can be. So there's no academic jargon, no scary news type headlines, no empty attacks on one's politics and from either side. Just a basic and real conversation between a layman, so myself, Jesse McCarthy, and an expert, again, Amish Adalja. I hope you enjoy and gain something from it. I mean, I know I definitely did. And here we go. Amish, thank you very much for coming on today. I'm happy to have you. Thanks for having me. So, I mean, just to hop in here, so to just give everyone out there some context, you know, what's your quick background? Like, why are you someone we should be listening to regarding this whole coronavirus ordeal? So I'm an infectious disease, critical care and emergency medicine physician that uh, has focused that's had a focused career on emerging infectious diseases, pandemic preparedness, hospital preparedness, uh, biosecurity. And this has basically been what I've been working on since I was a training physician. And I've written multiple reports on this. I've I've spoken on this for a long, long time. I've written major academic papers talking about these threats from infectious diseases. And I'm also taking care of coronavirus patients now. Uh, So I I do feel like I've immersed in this field for some time. And it is what I I do on a day-to-day basis. Okay, and I've also I know this this kind of whole thing in some ways can get politicized, but I've seen you all over the news on all different media sites. Um, so that's you've you've kind of been running the gamut recently, yeah. Yeah, and that's been deliberate on my part. I've had offers to be exclusive contributors to at least two of the major networks, and I've turned them down because I want to be able to go on all three networks, uh, all three major cable news networks, because I do think at this time of a national emergency, when there is so much politicization, I think it's important that I can be on all three networks because I think it adds credibility, and I'm saying the same thing on all three networks, so that really, uh, in this in this world where everything is polarized and people want their own tribe to tell them certain things, uh, it does help to be on all three networks when you're looking to, to get people to trust what you're saying and, and take you seriously and take actions based on what you're saying. That's great. I mean, I personally appreciate that. So, um, and then would you, the three big networks for the audience, what are those? For people? So, so they're MSNBC, Fox, and CNN are the three big cable news networks that I'm talking about, but I've also been on other things as well. But, but those are the three that you're talking about. And that's kind of how people have uh, divided themselves based on what their preference is for news. Okay. And, you know, you're on, this is the Montessori Education Podcast. So for me, a lot of this goes back to Montessori is all about observation and kind of you know, understanding things for yourself. So I just want to start at the basics. So, and this means all the way, like, what is a virus in kind of simpleton language? So a virus is basically just a a piece of genetic material, either DNA or RNA wrapped in a protein. And it isn't something that's alive. It is something that has to be inside a cell to be able to have copies of itself. And what ends up happening is in that process of of it having itself copied by a cell, it can do damage to cells. It can provoke the immune system to attack it. And that's when you get diseases from viruses. And there are many viral diseases that range from influenza to measles to chickenpox to to smallpox. Uh, And they are probably one of the most ubiquitous things on this planet. There are viruses everywhere. The vast majority of them don't do anything to us maybe can't even infect us, but there is a small percentage that can do damage to us. And that's what we focus on. So when we normally think of viruses, think of something that's going to be pretty bad. But what you're saying is they're just out there all the time. And then some of them are particularly bad and some are just, they're not going to harm us in any way. Right. Every glass of water you drink is full of viruses. Okay. And then with this one, I know it's called, you know, there's so many different names, but coronavirus or COVID-19, why is it called that? Well, coronaviruses are a family of viruses, and what's distinct about them is when you look at them under a certain type of microscope, an electron microscope, it looks like they have little spikes coming out of their outer surface, and those spikes look like the, the spikes on a crown. 
and that's where it, it uh, got its name that it, it resembles a crown under an electron microscope awesome and then you know those are my simpleton kind of questions but is there anything else that you think of kind of basics of viruses or of this one in particular that every you know educated human being should know I would say that, you know, viruses, are, like I said, are everywhere, and it's only a very mi small minority of them that can infect humans. And when they do infect humans, they can do it through a variety of ways. Some viruses are spread through the respiratory route, like this coronavirus, that's coughs and sneezes. Some are airborne, like measles, where they can remain suspended in the air. Some are blood and body fluid, like HIV. Uh, and, and, and some are fecal oral, like hepatitis A, for example, or the norovirus, where people's fecal matter uh, is ingested and, and that causes the disease. So there's many mechanisms of transmission. There's many families of viruses. And, and because they're so different from each other, there's not one specific drug that you can use for a virus. Viruses have very specific treatments for them. So you have a virus uh, like, like herpes simplex virus, which causes cold sores. And there are specific vi antivirals that work on it, but don't work on influenza, for example. So they are very distinct from each other, even though they're all viruses. Okay. And it's funny, kind of hearing you talk, I, you know, I'm in early education and Montessori in particular, but often children get very excited about what they're into and they know so many facts and you just, it strikes me as you're similar, but you're an adult. So this is a very unique field you're in. Did, how did you get into it? Was it something from early childhood or where did the interest come from? Just on a personal note. So when I was little, my favorite children's book was uh, The Value of Believing in Yourself, which is the story of Louis Pasteur and the discovery oh, yeah, of the rabies vaccine. Yeah. So I, I, I basically had the book memorized when I was a child, even before I could read. I could uh, Even when I was not really good at reading, I knew when to turn the pages because I had uh -huh. it memorized. So that was a book that I read over and over again, and I still read it over and over Um and I think that put something in my mind. I didn't initially go into medicine. I, I ended up being interested in some other stuff as well. But I, medicine was always in my mind. And I, always, I was initially double majoring and trying to, to keep, it, um, keep the interest alive. And then um, I realized that after about six months that of, of not doing science type of stuff, that that's really what I wanted to do. And when I knew that I was going to do it, I knew it was going to be infectious disease because I love oh. the detective work. I love all of the the fact that these that an infectious disease impacts all of society. That you have to know geography and history and sociology and everything uh, in a way that you don't for other types of uh, types of uh, medical conditions. So so that part of it is really what what drew me to infectious diseases. And I obviously grew up in the 1980s and had the uh, had had HIV kind of looming. Both my parents are physicians, uh, not infectious disease physicians, but it was something that I always was looking at or reading about or hearing about. And I think that it's, uh, I think it's, it's the best decision I've ever made is to be an infectious disease. Oh, that's great. So in thinking about, you know, you have a, you as a child and then just us growing up as human beings, trying to think as independently as possible about things. I want to get into the kind of facts of coronavirus or COVID-19. So just a, a, a interesting question. I'm getting data from everywhere, but who does COVID-19 actually affect? Like, what is the data showing here? Uh, you know, what's your take on this? So COVID-19 can infect anybody. Anybody is susceptible to this. This is a novel virus. The human race does not have population level immunity. But what we see with severe disease, those that require hospitalization, are is a clustering in those who are of advanced age, maybe age 60 and above or people with other medical conditions like diabetes or immunosuppressing conditions that put them at higher risk for severe infection. That doesn't mean that if you're 20 and fine that you're completely impervious to it. Chances are you will have a mild case, but there are going to be case reports of individuals that are healthy in the prime of their life that do get severe illness. It's just that when you look at the data, it's going to see the clustering on uh, at, at the extremes of age in those with co comorbid conditions or other medical conditions that they suffer from. Okay, so now you being kind of steeped in all of this, and, and most of us as just laymen out there, how do you, can you give us any guidance on how to stay sober minded about statistics versus anecdotes? Like, how do you approach that with normal people? Yeah. It's hard because there is a lot of stuff floating out there, and media on all, from all angles tends to accentuate the bad or the scary versus the, the positive or the or the good, and they don't often give you the same type of context. So you might see a headline that says, deaths double in this town, and they really just went up from two to four. 
Mm-hmm. And that that's very hard to for the general public to see the headlines. So I do think it's important that you actually go beyond the headlines and you look and see what you're reading to make sure it's coming from a credible source. And often the credible source is mainstream media. You just might have to read a little bit deeper into it, not just the headline to actually understand what's going on. Uh, I would also say that it's important to, to look at what the statistics that are coming out by local health departments and hospital systems, because th- there's actually raw numbers there and you can kind of understand what's going on. Uh, and then there is some, I think there is some benefit to anecdote, trying to understand how this is impacting you or impacting your friends or, or family members who might be in the healthcare industry, because they also give you a lot of good information about what it's actually like. And I think that can help you gauge how to, to think about this this virus, how to think about what risks there actually are for you uh, and what, what actions are the best for you to take to be able to kind of live in an environment where this virus is going to be circulating. Okay, thanks. That that's helpful, and I'm in in particular now thinking of you know social distancing that everyone is on. I mean, virtually everyone is doing this, and kind of every normal person knows stay away from big crowds. Obviously, don't be up in people's faces talking. But you know, I've heard this six foot distance. So, what's going on there? Why six feet? What's the science behind that? So the science is that you have respiratory droplets that can emanate from your body when you cough or sneeze. And these are kind of big droplets that everybody see videos of a sneeze. And they travel for a certain distance before the force of gravity brings them to the ground. And it's usually three to six feet. And six feet is kind of the upper bound that we try to take. Uh, In a hospital setting, it's often we say wear a mask if you're within three feet for droplet precautions. And that's pre-coronavirus outbreak in the past for, for influenza patients, for example, There'll be a sign on the door saying, if you're going to be within three feet of this patient, you need to wear a mask. And that's because these are droplets that fall to the ground. And I think that, that that's that's a good rule to have for the general public. Six feet is something that they can conceptualize and understand. Three feet can be a little bit, um, it can get a little dicey because people can get pretty close and you might have some circumstances where, where you can get some spread. So that there there is there is science based on on how things transmit through respiratory droplets that that underlies the six feet rule. Okay. And then I'm thinking even connected with that, just, you know, I've heard this, you know, should you have a mask? Should you not wear a mask? Some people are saying, well, it makes you feel comfortable. Like with the six feet rule, I can see somebody going, well, I just, if I put on a mask, then I I could be right up in somebody's face. Like what's your take on masks right now and, and why? You just gave the exact thing, the, the, the reason why I'm kind of skeptical about masks because people do get a false sense of security and yeah. they may not practice the social distancing appropriately. They may not wash their hands as much. They may touch their face more. They may not take care of their mask well. They may expose other people by leaving their mask laying around. And it's unclear how effective these masks are. And the reason why we're asking people to wear masks, and this is a controversial recommendation that I'm not 100% on board with, is that there are individuals who are asymptomatic, who have no symptoms from this virus, but may yet be contagious. And we've seen some transmission events. Usually they're in households where there's a lot of intimate contact or in extraordinary circumstances like choir practice where people are singing and that can obviously uh, generate uh, droplets of, of, uh, of spit and, and secretions that might get on other people even in the absence of coughing or sneezing. So what we think is that maybe if you're wearing a mask and you're one of those asymptomatic individuals, your breaths and your talking won't spread it to other people. So that's where that recommendation comes from. And I would say that that's not settled science and there are controversial uh, opinions about this. And there are even academic papers that show that those masks are not effective at stopping someone's cough or sneeze uh, from from uh, releasing uh, particles into the air that have the virus in them. So this is something that you're going to see evolve. And I think one of the important things to remember is we want to, if someone's wearing a household mask that they made themselves or they're just wearing their scarf around their face, that's not a big deal. We just don't want people to be buying or trying to buy hospital grade masks because those are in short supply in certain parts of the country. And we want to make sure we don't have a supply shock for the people who actually need those to work and function safely in the hospital environments. Okay. So let me come at you just from a real layman's perspective here. So when you talk about droplets and I'm seeing, thinking of somebody sneezing, it just kind of, you know, intuitively seems to make sense. If I put something over my face or my nose and my mouth, it just seems like, oh, that's going to reduce the amount that I could get on somebody else or even get from somebody else coming in. So is that, am I off there or like... No. So the the issue is, so we've always said that if you're sick, if you're coughing and sneezing and you have to go out, you should wear a mask. 
But the question is, should people who have no symptoms at all wear a mask? And that's what the new recommendations are from CDC, as well as from certain certain state governors. That's the question. So if you have no symptoms at all, is there any benefit to you wearing a mask? Are you going to be transmitting it to other individuals? And we know with wearing a mask, it does. Dec- if you are coughing and sneezing, it's going to decrease the amount of material that, that you eject into the environment. It's not 100%. It's, and, and that's clearly been shown in studies that it's not 100% that things get out around the mask. But do okay. should people who have no symptoms at all wear a mask? And if they do wear their own homemade mask, are they going to be more cavalier with their other social distancing? And, yeah. not, and not think of masks as a supplement or additive, but think of masks as a substitute. They're not yeah. a substitute for social distancing or hand washing. And that's what I'm worried about. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Now, connected with that, something I was just reading something last night. And what do you think about, you know, like dosage or amount? Like, I, I'm just thinking if somebody sneezes in my face and all this mucus comes at me, like it feels like, oh, there's a bigger chance that I'm going to get something like, or like a hospital worker that's just surrounded by this constantly. Is the amount that you're getting, is that connected with um, your potential for, you know, getting the virus and in a stronger case of it, or is that just not scientific in thinking? It is scientific thinking that there is probably a dose response in individuals who get exposed to high amounts, specifically healthcare workers who might get sprayed with a medical aerosol or, or some kind of uh, body fluid based on what they're doing to a patient. That could give them uh, an overwhelming infection. This is still an area of active scientific research, but there is a lot of biological plausibility to it. And we have seen this type of dose response relationship with other infectious organisms. Okay. Now, the question I'm going to ask, and I know it's a touchy subject, but in terms of any drugs like that are on the market right now that, that you think might aid in any way with this virus, or maybe not, and it's not good, and, and what's the evidence right now in, in that? So there's a lot of things floating around there about drug treatments, and we're at an early stage in this pandemic where we don't have a lot of hard data, a lot of anecdote is what's floating around. And there are some randomized clinical trials that are going on in China as well as in other parts of the world and including in the United States. So I do think it's important that we really reserve any kind of description of something being successful or being effective until we actually have randomized controlled data because there are so many things that can confound the interpretation of whether or not a medication works uh, based on who you're giving it to, when you're giving it to them. Is it is it the natural course of the illness to get better in these patients or to get worse in these patients? Uh, th- that being said, I do, I do think there's a role for experimental drugs, and I do think that um, there are certain medications that have already been FDA approved for other indications that can be repurposed. But I do think that even though that they're available and, and there are doctors prescribing drugs like hydroxychloroquine, for example, which is the one that's always in the news, that has to be done in a manner where you're actually being mindful about who you're giving it to and not giving it to mild patients who are going to do fine anyway, but giving it to people mm-hmm. who are most likely to benefit from this drug and less likely and, and less likely to have side effects that are going to wash away the, any kind of benefit that they have. So you want to make sure you're actually doing a, a risk-benefit analysis on the individual patient. And often that will be a patient that's hospitalized with pneumonia going through some kind of protocol that your hospital has saying this is this is who we think is going to benefit most from this and not have their their benefit outweighed by the risks because their case is too mild. So I, I do think that you're going to have much more data as we come, come through this. But right now, we're kind of in a, a little bit of a heavy anecdote phase, which hopefully will be replaced by solid data that can guide our rec- treatment recommendations much better uh, in the near future. Okay. And Kind of thinking about, let's say, not the serious patients right now, but let's say our our normal everyday Joe, like, is there anything, I know, again, you're saying a lot of this is anecdotal, but do you see anything that might be potential to kind of maybe boost people's immune systems? Because it seems, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like most people will end up getting this. So is it, is it something like if we can boost our immune systems, that would be helpful? Or is that also kind of just, you know, positive thinking, but not real science or reality? I do agree that I think most people will get this. This is an efficiently spreading respiratory virus, and we know it's it's a, a common cold-related virus, and those are, are ubiquitous and very hard to avoid. 
when people use the term immune boosting, I think it, it's kind of a nebulous term. It doesn't really mean anything medically. I would say if you're thinking about immune boosting, it's not a supplement that you take. Or you know, Some people might advocate vitamin D. I know the former CDC director talks about vitamin D. Um, you can get that from sunlight as well. Um, and, and that may be a benefit with a very little low side effect profile. But the other things that boost your immune system is are, are sleeping well, making sure that you get enough uh, get enough sleep, for example, or not binge drinking alcohol all the time. That those are all ways to boost your immune system without going to GNC and buying some supplement. Yeah, and I think that's the kind of thing I was speaking of because I'm I'm just curious of, you know, like like, like you said, basically somebody who's just partying all night or something like that. Are they at, at a higher risk of getting this and then potentially having a stronger kind of effect of this on them than say somebody who's like, listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay healthy, I'm gonna be sleeping, I'm gonna be eating right, I'm not gonna be getting hammered at night. Like, do they have a worse chance if they're doing the negative things? We know that with other respiratory viruses, people who have lifestyle that are low on sleep and high on stress and, and alcohol uh, tend to have more respiratory infections per, per year. So it, it may make you more susceptible. Obviously, we don't have all the data in on this mm -hmm. one, but in general, the principles for respiratory viruses apply. And I do think that someone who, who sleeps right and uh, refrains from binging and alcohol and exercises is going to probably have a better uh, fare better with this virus than somebody who doesn't, all things being equal. Okay. Now, I know you're you're super busy, so I want to get as much as we can here. So the one thing that I know is on a lot of people's minds is kind of a timetable. We're all in this kind of quasi-quarantine. Um, when do you think this is going to end, and then, and then why? Like, what's the evidence for your take on it? So it's important to remember that this virus isn't going to magically disappear when economic shutdowns are lifted. This is a virus that's established itself in the human population, and we're going to have to live with it. The rationale behind economic shutdowns is not to make this virus disappear, but to decrease its transmission dynamics, its kinetics, to a level that is more manageable by hospitals, because our hospitals in the United States operate almost at total capacity all the time, that there are severe concerns about shortages of mechanical ventilators and personal protective equipment and staffing. And that's what we're doing right now, is trying to decrease the spread so that you give hospitals the ability to deal with these cases. And it may be the same number of cases, but over a longer period of time at a, at a slower clip so that they don't go into crisis mode. So I, I do think that it's it's not going to be the case that this is going to be gone when social distancing lifts. It's not going to be gone until there's a vaccine, and that's going to be way off 12 to 18 months in the best case scenarios. But what will happen is that we will have a sense, and I think everybody's looking at New York City right now as it approaches or is in its apex to see whether or not it's the hospitals basically bust, basically if hospitals have to ration care or they, are they're able to meet the, the capacity. I'm optimistic that New York City, as extremely stressed as it is, will not break from this and that that will set the tone for the rest of the country and we mm -hmm. will start to see social distancing uh, recommendations be modified and maybe you'll start to see more businesses open with modifications schools open maybe with modifications and, and things will get back to some new baseline it won't be back to normal it's not that we're going to be having the super bowl uh, or you know the olympics have already been canceled mass gatherings are still going to be very problematic until we have a vaccine and we but we may see social distancing recommendations in, in other parts of cities and towns reanimate uh, and and it will still be important for those that are at high risk for severe complications the elderly those with other medical conditions to try and social distance as best as they can because they're still going to be at risk for getting severe illness but if we can get through this glut where the hospitals are really in danger of being overrun, and if we can increase our hospital capacity, increase our diagnostic capacity, make sure our local health departments are, are well resourced, I do think that we can get to sort of a middle way with this virus where it's not running rampant and, and running hospitals to the ground, but also not one where we're having a, a Wuhan China style lockdown where people yeah. can't uh, leave their houses. Now, I'm, I'm happy that you kind of, this is a real positive note about New York, and it seems that we're it's flattening out at least the death rate. Um, would, in terms of the vaccine, you seem very positive about us getting a vaccine in like say 12 to 18 months. Like how can one be so confident that we'll just be able to come up with a vaccine? Like, is that just the way vaccines work or is there something unique about this one? Or what are your thoughts on that? I think that there have been precedents with coronavirus vaccines in animals before. We do have veterinary vaccines for coronaviruses. This virus does seem amenable to a vaccine approach. We basically have a race around the world to, to make a vaccine, and there are already at least two 
vaccines and phase one clinical trials using innovative technology that really has only come to to fruition in the last 10 years. So I am very optimistic that we will be able to get a vaccine. But it's important to remember that a vaccine timeline is measured not in, in months, but usually in decades. So if we get this within a year and a half, that's really a, a, a great uh, push forward in, in terms of vaccine development technologies. So I think it's important to remember that while a vaccine is something that's on the horizon and we're very confident that one is going to be available eventually, the first waves of this virus are going to be fought without a vaccine. All right. Well, that's, I mean, it's positive long run, but um, I appreciate everything you've said. So that's basically all I have for your Amish. I want to get you out of here, but do you have any any last thoughts you want to share? Or I think it's just important to remember that when you hear that this pandemic was unpredictable and nobody knew it was going to happen, that's not the truth. There have been those of us in this field that have been talking about the danger of a pandemic for, for decades, that we've written reports, we've warned people, we've tried to prepare our country for this and predicted the bad outcomes that happened. And it's very frustrating when you're in this field and and you see everything that you predicted in a worst case scenario starting to happen because certain pro programs and principles that you said should have been enacted uh, several years ago have not been. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's an important thing to remember, that pandemic preparedness is something that's very important, should be thought of as part of national security. And when it's neglected, this is the result that you get. I'm curious with you saying that too on the ending here, like how do you think you can get people to understand something that they haven't personally experienced? Like I was just talking with a school owner in Hong Kong and she said, listen, we, we've all had, we had SARS, so we experienced this. So we're kind of somewhat, you know, really hyped up and prepared for something like this. How do you get people that are just so detached, like many of us in America to kind of understand something before, you know, they really see it for themselves? Like, do you have any sense of that? That's that's the big challenge, because what we have right now is a cycle of panic and neglect. So you have an outbreak and then everybody panics and then that outbreak recedes from the headlines and then you have neglect. And that thing ha that happened during anthrax. It happened during this, the, the worry over bird flu. It happened during 2009 H1N1. It happened during Zika. It happened during Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It happened during uh, Ebola. This happens every time. And, and that cycle has to break uh, if you're going to have any kind of resiliency in your country. And I think it's very challenging. I think we need to think about this the way we thought about the, again, going back to the 1980s when I grew up, um, thinking about the nuclear threat from the Soviet Union, that we every ch school child was worried about this and thought about it and mm -hmm. you knew to duck and cover. And we funded our defense, uh, Department of Defense in a way that was going to allow us to be able to survive a nuclear war and to be able to retaliate. We need to think of infectious diseases in that same manner uh, and, and fund them and fund preparedness that way in that type of a cycle. And think of this as a core part of our national security, because look at what we're in now. Yeah. So it sounds like just really thinking about this sensibly, getting the evidence and then being comfortable with saying, hey, this is a serious problem and not worrying if people are like, oh, stop, stop worrying, buddy, like that type of thing. Yeah, I, I do think it, it just has to take a reframing and really realizing what the risk is. And, yeah. and I think that that's a very hard thing to do because people's risk perceptions are changed. And we've lived in, a, in an era of relative, you know, prosperity without these types of threats. But these viruses don't pay attention to that. And they're still going to, to be threats. And we, we have a, a society that's very globally interconnected with many mega cities and many opportunities for viruses, even though it's a small proportion of them that can do this. But, but they can do it. And when they do it, um, if humans compound this by making mistakes with preparedness and, and decisions, uh, you're going to get these types of cascading negative effects that impact everyone when they could have been controlled at, at a much earlier stage without this type of disaster that we're seeing now. Yeah. Well, thank you for all the insight. This has been awesome. So thanks again, Amish. Thanks for having me.